It is 9 p.m. in Los Angeles, 9 a.m. in Sochi, and 2 on a Friday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Ga Young. Let's get a check of the main stories we're following at this hour. Now, the tears of joy and sorrow continue today during a second day of reunions for families separated since the Korean War at North Korea's Mount Kumgang Resort. Now, participants from both sides of the border are scheduled to meet on three different occasions today for a total of six hours. But uh, two families have had their reunions cut short, and for more on that and the day's events today, let's go live on the phone to our Shin Se-min. Se-min, uh, fill us in on the latest. Yes, the unexpected turn of events happened during the first session of reunions this morning when two South Korean participants had to come back home due to their health problems. A 91-year-old man and an 84-year-old woman did get to meet individually with their loved ones from the North yesterday and today, but had to do so in ambulances this morning. And this is just a reminder that time is running out for the families who have been waiting for more than 60 years to reconnect with their relatives. And most of those waiting are now in their 80s and 90s. Now, with the two South Korean participants out, there are just 80 South Korean families at Mount Kumgang. They had the chance to meet with their North Korean family members individually this morning in the hotel rooms they're staying in, and again at a group luncheon that just wrapped up a short while ago at 2 p.m. No, so, I mean, I personally met the 91-year-old man when I was up there in Kosang with him, and I know that he had to be ambulanced up to the north, and he was so determined to go up to north and meet his uh, children, but um, this is a very, very sad moment for him and how the time is running out. Now, so, I mean, looking ahead to the afternoon, what's on the schedule for the rest of the group? Yes, a third event will begin at 4 o'clock today where all separated families will gather together for a ceremony in an auditorium. After that, the participants will have one more day to spend with their families on Saturday before heading back home. And once they leave, a second round with new participants will begin on Sunday and run through Tuesday. Konyang. All right, that was our Shin Se-min reporting live on the inter-Korean family reunions, a very rare one to note, taking place as we speak at the North Mount Kumgang Resort. Now, shifting our focus, the Korean government is up in arms about remarks made by a top Japanese official in which he suggested re-examining Tokyo's 1993 apology for the Japanese military's use of sex slaves during World War II. Kim Hyun-bin reports. In 1993, Japan's then chief cabinet secretary, Yohei Kono, apologized for the tens of thousands of women that were forced into sexual slavery during World War II. But on Thursday, Tokyo's current cabinet secretary, Yoshihide Suga, said the Japanese government will re-examine the so-called Kono statement to verify the accuracy of interviews given by Korean women who said they were forced to serve as prostitutes for Japan's wartime military. We will assemble a team of government officials and experts to re-examine the 1993 statement from an academic standpoint. Seoul has condemned Tokyo for making moves to take back its apology and disregard its imperialistic past and historical wrongdoings. Unlike Japan, Germany has made and continues to apologize for its wartime atrocities and compensates victims to this day. In a separate issue, Korea has slammed the Japanese government's plan to hold its controversial Takashima Day ceremony on Saturday, an attempt to claim Korea's Tokto Island as their own. Takashima is the name Japan uses for Tokto Island. Korea's foreign ministry has also slammed Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's plans to send cabinet members to the annual event. The Korean government is calling on Japan to cancel the ceremony, but Tokyo has dismissed Seoul's demand, saying the celebration does not concern other nations. Korea reclaims sovereignty over its territory, including Tokto and many other islands around the Korean peninsula upon its independence from Japanese rule in 1945. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News.
アディラン、Now on DirectTV。Well, it's roughly in 5 past 2 p.m. on a Friday here in Seoul, and 5 past 9 p.m. on a Thursday evening over in Los Angeles. Now, many of you already may be aware of the fact that Arirang TV has expanded its global reach in the United States. Now available on Direct TV, America's number one satellite television provider. Now you can now tune in to Arirang on channel 2095 on Direct TV. And to mark this very special occasion, our Sean Lim joins me live from our studio in Los Angeles. Good evening to you, Sean. Well, good afternoon to you over there, Kan Young. Many Direct TV customers in the United States may be happy to see Arirang TV now in their channel lineup. Direct TV, which is based here in Southern California, is a satellite-based television service that competes with cable TV. And Arirang is now one of Direct TV's public interest channels, so that means HD subscribers don't have to pay any extra money to enjoy Arirang TV programming. Now, Sean,、uh, you and、uh, several of our Arirang colleagues have been working in Los Angeles for the past week or so, and、uh, I know that you guys have been covering some stories there. Right. While、well, our team was here in LA to cover the Direct TV launch, we also delved further into the debate into the Comfort Women statue. Placed outside of Glendale City Hall, it is an exact replica of the original that can be found in front of the Japanese Embassy in Seoul. And our Hong Jie met with key people who are bringing this humanitarian issue to light. And I'm going to turn things over to her, Jie. Sean, I'm standing at the Glendale Central Park where the Comfort Woman statue sits, and right behind me, Glendale City officials and a Korean American group say the bronze statue is about remembering the past and educating the future. Since being installed last summer, the Comfort Woman Memorial statue in the city of Glendale has been at the center of controversy. The statue honors 200,000 women, mostly Korean, who were forced into prostitution for the Japanese military during World War II. Phyllis Kim, a member of the Korean American Forum of California, which led the charge to get the monument up, hopes the bronze statue educates people. We want to、uh, want the people to know about the pains and sufferings of the victims and what really happened、um, during 1930s and World War II to these women. City officials have been under a lot of pressure to remove the statue through thousands of emails and phone calls, some even from the Japanese government. Glendale City Council member Ada Najarian says, however, that removal is not an option. Several things for those that want to remove it. The first thing is that this statue will not be removed.、Uh, it will not be、uh, taken away forever. All this is adding pressure on the Japanese government, which has been taking an aggressive nationalistic stance recently. Representative Adam Schiff, who, along with two other lawmakers, sent a letter to Secretary of State John Kerry asking him to address comfort women issues with the Japanese government, says that such views are broadly held among American politicians. Representative Schiff was also a strong supporter of a 2007 resolution on the issue of comfort women.、Uh, they should hear an apology. Uh, and they should not hear、uh, any prominent、uh, officials in Japan speaking uh, either uh, with deliberate ambiguity or worse, with denial about this chapter in history. And many residents here in Glendale say that they're proud that the community they're included in is acting on an issue that needs recognition, putting the risky nationalism in Japan in an even riskier position. It's good in Glendale. Like I mean, we have a lot of Asian community, the people, and they live here. We love to have them, so why not be supporting them? I think the concept of it is really great.、Um, I、yeah. think that you know, if it's something that needs to be recognized and apologized for, then you know, to have a piece of work to represent something like that is pretty. Have to、awesome. be in a neighborhood where we can say they did it here, you know, which is kind of special. I like the the fact that、uh, they chose our our park. 
to to develop this uh, uh, honoring statue. In the meantime, the Korean American group is aiming to set up more comfort women statues in other cities, but the possible installation is kept as a secret since they are facing strong opposition. Sean? All right, thanks, GA. And in another hot issue here in the United States, a new law in the state of Virginia to reform school textbooks seems imminent. Our Kim Anul over in Washington, D.C., has more on the grassroots efforts to adopt the proper usage of the name East Sea when describing the body of water separating Korea and Japan. Hanul, hello there. Yes, Sean. The bill is waiting for final approval from Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, and sources say it will likely take place in a quiet manner by the end of this month. Well, there was some political opposition to stop this bill, but educators are welcoming the news. Well, I had a chance to sit down with a public school official in Virginia to discuss the impact this will have on the students. Textbook publishers supplying new textbooks to Virginia's public schools in 2016 will be required to add the name East Sea to reference the body of water separating Korea and Japan alongside the name Sea of Japan. This means by 2017, students will likely see both names in maps and history books and atlases. Since six other schools in the region also purchased textbooks from the same big-name publishers, the move will affect seven states in total. An education official from Fairfax County, Virginia, where 40,000 out of 1.1 million residents are Korean, believes the change will have a positive impact on students. I think it's helpful to have the EC designation in the textbooks because we are a very diverse community and uh, in addition it's good for students to hear other perspectives why certain populations might feel um, a way about a name. I think it brings up a good conversation topic in the classroom. High support from Korean American voters in electing Virginia's new governor also played a role in passing the bill. It's, it's more of a political issue in Virginia. Um, our current Korean American population in Virginia is 82,000. Our Japanese American population is only 19,000. So I think it was easy for um, the Korean Americans to make their case. Following the success in Virginia, the grassroots movement is spreading to other states as well. Most recently, Maryland, also the state of New York, New Jersey, and California, uh, pushing to pass a similar bill. Back to you, Sean. All right, thanks, Hanul. And that does it for us here from our Los Angeles studio at our sister station, RKTV. Direct TV subscribers with access to Arirang TV can now tune in to channel 2095 or request it from their operator. Back to you guys in Seoul. All right, thank you, Sean, for that. It was great to see you and a very good job for all of our team and crew there in Los Angeles. That was our Sean Lim joining us live our, from our special studio in Los Angeles to mark Arirang TV becoming available on major U.S. satellite service direct TV. And now let's over uh, move over to Sochi, and for that we're joined live in the studio by our uh, special Olympics correspondent Iteho. Good afternoon, Iteho. Good afternoon. Now uh, we got to start with the women's figure skating. I mean, um, you know, a lot of uh, Koreans stayed up or you know woke up early today morning to watch uh, Kim Yuna's last performance as an athlete. That's right, and I was amongst one of those who stayed up late watching the whole competition, and fittingly, she skated to the song Adios No Niños, and she skated in an absolutely flawless program. But despite her uh, 
flawless program, the results weren't what many expected. So that was kind of disappointing indeed. Right. And um, this morning, a lot of the media, like uh, international media as well as the local media, have been uh, uh, covering the controversies coming up with the uh, marking system uh, for figure skaters. Well, the results were definitely a shocker to many fans around the world, and not just fans, many media outlets are quite shocked as well at, over the results of last, uh, this morning's competition. And uh, in what has become rather an anonymous numbers game for the figure skating competition, not even a perfect skate was enough to secure the gold for uh, Kim. And it was somebody who did not skate a perfect uh, program, Adelina Sotnikova uh, of Russia, that won the gold medal out of the three who did skate uh, in the top three coming into the free skate program. I mean, uh, Kim Yuna, of course, um, uh, from her interview after the performance, uh, was uh, she seemed shocked, however, okay about this uh, whole thing, having enjoyed her last Olympics and winning a silver medal because uh, I think uh, more or less she was proud that she had uh, two clean programs in the Olympics uh, season this year. But um, a lot, it's, a, it's become an outrage for many others. Well, I mean, she was, I guess, the only one who was really accepting of this. She mentioned that, you know, she wasn't the one to uh, give out the scores at the judges' jobs. And she, she was very accepting of it. And in, true, uh, in a true champion style, she was very elegant and graceful about the comments and the remarks uh, that were making headlines around the world. But I think she was the only one. Katarina Witt, who was uh, commentating in the German booth, came out and said she was stunned by the results. She doesn't understand the scoring. ESPN had, uh, for a while, had uh, the figure skating competition title, uh, Home Cooking, then it was changed to Home Ice Advantage, and now it's changed again to Questions on Ice. And of course, the article was about uh, the whole, uh, the results, uh, the, the, the scoring by the judges. So um, it, it was uh, quite a shocker to many around the world. Even Ashley Wagner, who skated for Team USA, I think she put it best when she said, you know, people aren't going to watch a sport where people who fall down score higher and win a competition over people who skate perfectly clean programs. And I think she was uh, right on the money there, though. Right. Um, I mean, there is no denouncing Adelina Sotnikova. I mean, she skated very well, and I'm sure she is an excellent athlete as well. But, uh, you know, I think another thing about the judgment or the, uh, the calls that are made in figure skating, um, the problem is that the judges remain anonymous. And, you know, somebody needs to be held accountable for these marks that they're given. And uh, because this is not a uh, competition between athletes, you know, right on the spot where we can see it. Now, uh, let's look at what happened. How, does, how did the scoring break down? Well, basically what happened, I mean, Satnikova, she skated a wonderful program. She, was, she is a wonderful up-and-coming athlete. However, the scores were maybe a little bit biased. A lot of people were shocked at the disparity between first and second place. Kim scored 144.19 in her free skate program for a total of 219.11, which was almost a six-point difference with Satnikova, of course, who scored a total of 224.59. So it is quite a wide uh, point margin between between the first and second places. And I think the biggest difference was, of course, uh, Satnikova had a technically more difficult program. She had seven triple jumps, uh, four in combination, as opposed to Kim's uh, six triple jumps, three of uh, which were in combination. And of course, uh, another big difference was in the level of difficulty placed on uh, uh, Satnikova's spins and footwork uh, compared to Kim's. So uh, despite a more artistic performance and, you know, to the eyes of, um, of those who, who are not experts in figure skating, I mean, uh, it seemed like Kim Yuna skated a perfect 10, but, um, you know, despite all, Kim lost because her program was not as difficult as Sotnikova. Is that right? That's basically right on the money there. Uh, basically what happens, Sotnikova had a larger pool of points available to earn compared to Kim. So even if it's Kim, who skated a perfect program, maybe she didn't uh, quite reach the number of points that Sotnikova did, which is kind of uh, very difficult to understand for many fans and uh, difficult for even the skaters to understand. And there is uh, the aspect of home ice advantage, of course, that we mentioned before, and especially because four of the nine judges were repicked during the last minute, one of which who was a, uh, the wife of the Russian Skate Federation uh, president, and of course uh, another judge who was uh, uh, flagged for uh, match fixing in the 98 Nagano game. So the, the, the choices for judges were kind of questionable as well here. 
Well, you know, um, despite all, I think Kimena finished off uh, her her career as an as an athlete, as a figure skater, in a very graceful and elegant manner, like she has always been. And we all enjoyed seeing her um, perform on ice again for a second Olympics, which is quite rare for a figure skater, right, to perform in two different Olympics. Definitely. I mean, if she had scored gold here at the uh, 2014 Sochi Games, she, it would have made her only the third woman in Olympic history to score back-to-back -back medals or back-to-back -back gold medals at Olympics. And uh, she, despite the results of this uh, competition, I think in the eyes of many, she remains a true champion and she shined and, uh, you know, she finished out her career as she always did in her trademark artistic style. Uh, she didn't go aim for the hardest technical uh, program, but uh, the artistic element to her performances, I think uh, many fans who are not experts of figure skating even noticed that, you know, the performance that she put on was very expressive and something akin to something you would see at the theater. Right, and also, you know, finishing on the podium for two consecutive Olympics, that's a great, excellent deed already. So, um, all congratulations to her. But how did the rest of the uh, competition uh, shape up? Well, Carolina Costner of Italy, who is actually 27 years old, one of the older uh, figure skaters in this competition, finished out her uh, perhaps her last competition as a professional as well, on the podium in third place, taking home the bronze with a free skate uh, uh, score of 142.62. Gracie Gold of Team USA finished fourth, while Russia's new sweetheart, Yulia Lipnitskaya, rounded out the top five, coming in at fifth place. And also, uh, Asada Mao of Japan also did a wonderful free skate program. She skated the best free skate program of her life. She leaped 10 spots coming into uh, uh, the free skate program. She was 16th. She finished 6th overall. So a wonderful job by all the athletes, despite all the controversy with the scoring. Well, um, you know, all the uh, congratulations to Malasada as well. I mean, we've uh, been seeing her in the headlines side to side with Kimena for the past, uh, you know, eight years perhaps and um, you know all congratulations to her and despite the results Kim Yuna will be remembered as one of uh, Korea's and the world's legendary figure skaters uh, for for many many years now uh, thank you Taehyung for that wrap-up and uh, we'll see you again uh, on Monday for a wrap-up coverage of the 2014 Winter Games all right now, staying in Sochi, as we edge closer to the climax of the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, the spotlight gradually shifts to the next host city, the Korean resort town of Pyeongchang. To hear what Pyeongchang has learned from Sochi and what to expect during the closing ceremony, Arirang News' Song Jisun sat down with the head of Pyeongchang's organizing committee. For the over 200 personnel dispatched to Sochi from Pyeongchang, nothing is too big or too small to go unchecked or unobserved. The pressure is on, as in less than four years' time, the eyes of the world will be focused on whether Pyeongchang is ready to take up the mantle as an Olympic host city. As next in line, how would the chief organizer of Pyeongchang 2018 rate the way the Sochi Games have been run? Overall, we believe it was a successful Olympic Games. Sochi 2014 had all the big venues in one place at the Olympic Park. The weather and the volunteers were also very pleasant. Pyeongchang is more compact due to the fact that all our clusters are within 30 minutes of each other. But after studying the way it is organized here, we want to reinforce the efficiency of our venues. With the curtain drawing down on Sochi, the world will watch as the Olympic flag is passed to the Korean delegation during Sunday's closing ceremony. The ceremony is expected to culminate with a grand performance of Korean dance and various mixes of Korea's traditional song, Arirang. Korea is relatively less well known than many other countries around the world, so we want to incorporate that mysterious oriental side when introducing Pyeongchang. And as Pyeongchang 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of this whole Summer Olympics in 1988, we want to portray Korea, now a developed country, from a country that was catching up with others three decades ago. Kim adds it is crucially important Korea does more than just host the games. He say,
the nation's athletes need to win medals. Aside from everything else, what really counts is how well the host country's athletes do. Russia has succeeded in that up until now. And I want to stress that Korea must work together to boost our chances. I've seen the potential we have, not just in skating, but in winter sliding events and freestyle skiing. I'm sure Korean athletes can make Pyeongchang their stage in four years' time. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News, Sochi. That is all for me at this hour. Thank you for watching. I'll be back with more of the day's latest at 4 p.m. Korea time. See you then.